joining us for the first time, I believe, uh, Nancy Frazier. She is a professor of political and social science at the New School for Social Research, author of Cannibal Capitalism, How Our System is Devouring Democracy, Care, and the Planet, and What We Can Do About It. Nancy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So, all right, let's let's start with um, the argument that you're making that um, that we are facing uh, multiple crises um, a- across our society, and um, and and how that um, uh, would lead to an expanded conception of capitalism. Yeah, exactly. I, I think we're in a, a, a very rare moment historically of a severe crisis, the sort of crisis that historians would call a general crisis, meaning it's not confined to one sector. It's not only an economic crisis or only an ecological crisis or only a political crisis, but it's all of that rolled into one. So it's a crisis that is engulfing the whole social order. Now, I think that what lies at the bottom of this crisis are some deep irrationalities that are hardwired into our social structure, which is a capitalist social structure. But familiar views of capitalism focus one-sidedly on its economic dimension, and they would generally uh, direct our attention to looking at the economic aspect of the crisis. You're, t- you're that, talking about a, a Marxist critique. Exactly. Marxist or social democratic, uh, you know, uh, left-wing theories derived from Marx and so- in softer or harder forms, let's say. Um, the problem is those theories have tended to be too economy-focused. They haven't been expanded to take in other crisis tendencies, other contradictory and perverse aspects of capitalism, those which lead it periodically to ecological crises, to social crises, and to political crises. So what my book does is try to develop a different and larger view of what capitalism is that shows how it is primed, hardwired, to generate not just periodic economic crises, but general crises of the sort we're facing now, which also include these other dimensions. Okay, so let's talk about these uh, other dimensions and um, and 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 the and the crises that are um, uh, uh, contained there, and then and then I, I just want to go a little bit deeper into um, how these different sectors and and which make up this general crisis um how they essentially broadly constitute capitalism um but let's let's start with these the these various sectors i guess we could start with the economy um outline for us the crisis that we have in this economy well i I would say overall um understood in the most human way, which is the way we should be thinking about it, it's a massive deterioration in the conditions of life that the overwhelming majority of people on the planet are facing, either because their livelihoods are imperiled, because the work does not pay a living wage, certainly not a a wage on which you could support a, a family, And so people are driven into debt and that creates a whole new wonderful set of profit opportunities for now not the manufacturers, but for the banking and financial sector. So um, we've had the offshoring of production to low wage regions. We've had the weakening of unions, which were the only institutions that, you know, in, in our country managed to support the claims of uh, working people for decent wages. We've got the precarization of work, no more like lifelong secure jobs, uh, you know, that you could uh, build, build a life with some predictability around. Jobs that can disappear in a flash and that usually get replaced by even more insecure, precarious, and even less well-paid jobs. 
So people are having to moonlight, that you have to cobble together an income uh, based on a, a whole set of different streams, uh, different family members contributing if you have a, a family with more than one adult. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a big hot mess for the majority of people who do not have independent sources of family wealth or property ownership. And this is the case in the United States, which has always thought of itself as a relatively wealthy country. But think about the uh, other parts of the world that, you know, have never thought of themselves as wealthy and that are equally uh, suffering from being more or less expelled from the official circuits of economic exchange and production. More and more people are thrust outside of all that without much hope of ever finding a way in. It's uh, from an economic point of view, it's a mess. Okay. And, and let's, uh, let's talk about uh, social reproduction and just, you know, um, for, for those who haven't, who aren't familiar with the term, uh, um, explain to us what social reproduction is and, and how in, in, um, in this era where it's in crisis. Exactly. I think people who may not know this technical term, social reproduction, will know what I'm talking about if I talk about a crisis of care or a care crunch. Uh, we we hear a lot about family work uh, imbalance and so on. Now, um, what I've just said uh, about the crisis of work, that all pertains to paid work. But there's a whole nother fund of work that's absolutely essential in a capitalist society which is largely unpaid. And that is the work of care or social reproduction. That is the, the, the birthing, the raising, the socializing of, of children, the new generations of workers. It's the replenishing and restoring of existing workers who have to be fed and cleaned and rested and so on in order to continue work. It's care for the elderly, for community, family, and friends. Now, that work has traditionally been done for the most part, not exclusively, but for the worst, for the most part, by women. It's gendered work, uh, you know, care. That's a feminine thing, supposedly, in our way of thinking. Uh, but um, uh, nowadays, women have been drawn into the paid workforce, partly because of what I said before the destruction of the idea of a family wage in which a, a man, let's say, could earn enough to support the whole family without a working wife. Okay, that kind of system is gone. And instead, women's wage work is essential, both for the profit makers, for the corporate sector, which needs it, and for the families who rely on that income. Well, that means that the time, the energy, and so on, that was required before for this contribution, this essential contribution in care work, is being siphoned off to the corporate sector, to the profit sector. And add to that, that there has been pressure from investors uh, to on states, on governments, to cut back social spending all this talk about the deficit and so on. So we have the contraction of social services at just the moment when women have less time to devote to care work privately, all of the state supports for care in the form of, of daycare, childcare, elder care, healthcare, all of these things are under pressure. It's a perfect storm of social reproductive crisis. Where is, is the energy? Where is the time? Where is the, uh, the, the, the revenue uh, that's gonna support this gonna come from? Where do we see um, the, the implications? I mean, is that in, we have um, uh, children that maybe are uh, entering into um, a school with more of a, uh, a vocabulary deficit, or we're seeing people who are um, 
uh, you know, having to go into nursing homes uh, before maybe prematurely because there is no ability to care for them at home. Where, like, where do we see, where does this manifest itself in terms of like, I, I, and certainly, I mean, I, I understand the concept of the stress that's associated with it, but where do we see, where do we see those outcomes? Well, frankly, uh, in a whole lot of ways, I think even, uh, although this might, I, I couldn't spell this out quickly. I think even in decline in, in life expectancy, actually, in certain sectors of the population, because of you know just being socially cut off, let's yep. say, um, not being touched, even you know things like that. But also, just think about the institutional side of this. Look at what goes on in nursing homes, in hospitals, in schools huge class size in schools because we're not putting the money into that. Um, I just had a friend who had a hip replacement who um, at one of the premier hospitals in New York City who actually spent the night on a gurney in a hallway because they didn't have a bed for him. Uh, this kind of stuff is happening more and more. Um, nurses have uh, caseloads that exceed their capacity to actually do their job. This is all part of this crisis of care because care is not only done in the, in the private home or in the community, but also in these institutions that require uh, public support as well as private investments of time and energy. Uh, you write too that we're facing a crisis of the environment. I think, I mean, I think that's hopefully people are you know uh, it's self-explanatory i mean i think that hopefully that people understand that we we you know uh, one third of pakistan was was underwater uh, uh recently we've had uh mass massive drought for years out in the, the west coast of this country uh we we've seen it you know um we, we can see it everywhere i mean uh, uh, uh around the world well talk about the the crisis in in the context of politics um that we're, that we're facing I think there are two uh, dimensions of this. Uh, I mean, one is that a capitalist economy, in order to function the way it's supposed to, requires public powers. It requires public goods, infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, and now, as we know, uh, a broadband. And uh, we can even talk about the care infrastructure, uh, which was discussed a while back in the Congress. Uh, th th this is, uh, it requires uh, regulatory capacity, right? Because, you know, capitalists uh, need sometimes to be disciplined for their own good. They would often put the, the thirst for short-term profit uh, over a longer-term sustainable economic system. So it's kind of like uh, Ulysses, you have to tie them to the mast uh, so that they won't uh, destroy uh, their, their own uh, profit system. Uh, so in wh what I'm saying then is that, um, hang on a second, I've sort of lost my thread here. Uh, yeah, so- yeah, we, have, uh, we have two aspects uh, yeah. of, of our the crisis in politics. Regulatory capacity and, uh, and uh, public good infrastructure, at least. Uh, there are other things too. Uh, legitimacy, credibility. I mean, look, think about the Supreme Court now, the possibility of its loss of legitimacy. That, so there's a tendency to hollow out the public powers that the system needs because corporations and investors don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay the taxes to, that all of this requires to support it. And they want to capture the regulatory agencies put their own lobbyists in there. We know about the revolving door, people who work in the public agencies and then leave and go right back to corporate jobs, the very corporations they were supposed to be overseeing, right? So there's regulatory capture and there is uh, essentially um, the loss of legitimacy. All of this means that we actually don't have the public powers that we need to rein in corporate power. And if we don't have that at the national level, we certainly don't have it at the transnational and global level, because after all, we have problems that can't be solved at the national level. 
we have some problems that require larger public powers, environment, climate change, uh, public health in an age of pandemic, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So, um, uh, and we don't have the public powers there that the, 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 the investors, the mega corporations, they know how to uh, offshore and jurisdiction shop. They find ways to escape the state powers that try to constrain them. And out there, beyond the states, it's a no man's land where they can sort of uh, do what they want. So that's one aspect, but there's also a second, and this I would call, uh, to use another technical term, the hegemonic dimension of crisis, meaning loss of legitimacy, loss of credibility. When governance doesn't work, when people feel their governments can't solve their problems or won't solve their problems, even if they could, then they start to lose faith in the system and they start looking for alternatives. That's the situation we're in now, I think, politically. It's why the mainstream public parties have lost a lot of their support. It's why people are gravitating to more radical, even out of the box ways of thinking. In some cases, those out of the box ways of thinking are actually promising and could lead to a, 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 a what I would call a progressive or an emancipatory restructuring of the system, which I'd be all in favor of. But plenty of the alternatives that right. people are trying out today are really noxious. And I if mean, you and if you look internationally, I think we're we're I mean as well as in this country uh, the there's a pretty pronounced trend towards that that more noxious version of authoritarianism and um, and, and revanchism that we're seeing across the, the globe. All right, so those are the areas in which we're facing these crises. And we should say that these crises are also from the perspective of the capitalist system. They're, they're crises that we're, we're not, we don't, we're not, we're not observing these crises um, as a critique of, of capitalism as much as it is um, as a it's a problem that even for capitalism itself, uh, we should say. I mean, that's the cannibalistic um, uh, um, uh, quality of this. Um, it is um, it's almost like beyond cannibalism when you start when the snake starts eating its own tail on some level. Uh, but what. What is just let's just take this moment to, to sort of like um, place where we are in terms of capitalism that has brought us to this this point, because this is we are living in an era of uh, of capitalism that is um, may have been sort of a natural uh, progression uh, of capitalism. But we, we place it in context and sort of like temporarily uh, uh, to get a notion of it and then. Yeah. as a way of also introducing the idea of of what happens next with capitalism or the different possibilities uh, of what happens next. Great. Yeah. I mean, uh, I should start by saying that uh, all of the crisis forms that we've been discussing, all of the aspects of crisis, are, are happening in a way that is non-accidental. They are happening not in spite of, but because of, the system's inherent dynamics and structure. That's important. That means that every form of capitalism will have some kind of a tendency to crisis. Now, that doesn't mean that the crisis always becomes severe, like at the present, uh, but, it, but the tendency is there. And that brings me to your point about the history. How do we understand what the pr present form of capitalism is in relation to past forms? And I would say that this is more or less the fourth phase in the history of capitalism. We had, first of all, a form of mercantile capitalism in the 16th through 18th centuries. That's the period in which uh, European uh, uh, wealth went abroad and conquered the so-called New World and instituted uh, slavery and so on and so forth. Then we got the rise of industrial capitalism in the 19th century. And that's, we now see with the benefit of hindsight, 
That's the invention of the steam engine of mass production industry, the beginning of fossil capitalism, and hence the beginning of the greenhouse gas uh, crisis that we're now living from. Then we got an attempt to correct that, to tame the system in so-called social democratic or New Deal capitalism. That comes in the, in the uh, interwar period in the United States and in the post-war period in much of Europe. It, and, and by the way, that coincides with decolonization and the attempt in the ex-colonial world to build what uh, to, to build developmental states that would also try to soften the hard edges of capitalism by using state power. Now, that was until, let's say, the 1970s, the you could, it's been called the golden age. The French call it the 30 glorious years of capitalism. Uh, but uh, basically that began unraveling in the 1970s as corporations staged what has now become a successful revolt against the regulations, against the softening efforts to use state power, uh, right? To tame capitalism. They revolted against that and essentially have given us neoliberal capitalism. This is what neoliberalism means. And that it has put those inherent crisis tendencies always involved in capitalism, that has put them on steroids. It has brought that these contradictions to a fever pitch in every sector that we've talked about, in social reproduction, in the political sector, in the economic sector and in the ecological sector. Neoliberalism has sharpened capitalism's inherent contradictions to the, to the breaking point. And, and that's where we are now. And COVID really highlights this, right? I mean, uh, like the failure um, or the inability for our institutions to actually rein in the beast that is capitalism because transnationally we were unable to really effectively address covid without having someone like bill gates uh come in and essentially say well we're gonna hoard this vaccine ip i mean in terms of an example that touches on all of those uh, points that you do, that you laid out there covid is is a great one unfortunately I think that's absolutely true. I think you can see every strand of our current crisis all sort of converging in this pandemic moment that we've just lived through and are, are I guess, still living through. Uh, first of all, there's the ecological strand because at, where did where did the COVID uh, virus come from? Uh, uh, it, it came from species being brought close to each other that had previously never connected so that the, the viruses that had been in the bats forever were able to leap to other species and then from them to us. And what brought all these species into contact? Global warming and uh, the destruction of rainforests and other forms of, of development in pursuit of profit, right? Which, which destroyed habitats and caused mass species migrations. So I think the ecological is very closely related to the epidemiological. And we are going to see more epidemics and pandemics because of destruction of rainforest and because of ongoing greenhouse gas emissions and planetary heating. That's going to happen. Okay, but then there's the question of what are the resources that we have to deal with it? And you're absolutely right, the political side of this becomes important because if we had had robust public health infrastructure and robust transnational health infrastructure and governance capacity, we could have done a lot better than we did. I think the result was gonna be bad in any case, mm -hmm. but we could have done a hell of a lot better if we had had those resources. But neoliberalism had hollowed out those resources had privatized much of our prior public health uh, infrastructure. And today, the, the majority of, of, uh, of capacity that we have available on the planet for health is in the hands of private profit-oriented corporations who care nothing about the public good, 
who care about their profits. And of course, we know the scandal of therapeutics and vaccines being unavailable to large parts of the globe, even though um, that's going to hurt the wealthy regions who do have them as well in the long run. We know that. The irrationality is mind boggling. But then look at the social reproduction dimension. There's, that's there as well, because what did we see in COVID during lockdown? Uh, at how the whole sort of care thing got reprivatized into the world of family and how impossible it was for that to go on there, uh, given, uh, you know, with kids uh, being uh, trying to do remote schooling, what a disaster that was people who were lucky enough to do remote work, and not everyone was, uh, still having to multitask like crazy. Then the so-called essential workers who had to be out there on the front lines uh, in, in, in very unsafe conditions without the resources to refuse and demand safe conditions, without unions to back them, uh, you know, without labor rights or, or federal uh, labor bureaucracy to support them. Uh, so, you know, all of that, the, the care side of this uh, was, was a disaster as well. And then, um, you know, the other thing back to the economic, I would say, um, you know, capitalism prides itself, its ideologues tell us that, that there's nothing like the market to tell you the true value of everything. You know, what, whatever the market says, that's what things are really valued as. Well, this pandemic showed how false that idea is because we talked about essential work and we saw what work was essential to actually keep us alive and more or less functioning in under pandemic conditions. And yet we know that those workers doing that essential work were treated as totally disposable. They were exposed to disease, they were paid a pittance. Uh, and um, so uh, there's a lesson here and, and that market, labor markets do not actually, right, value things at their true worth. We need other social mechanisms to ensure that everyone is justly compensated for what they contribute. I think that there's a sense in which the COVID pandemic was a kind of textbook lesson in how irrational capitalism is as a social system. But are we going to learn that lesson and do something about it? Ha! Huh, that remains to be seen. Even in the classification of essential workers, right? One is essential to, uh, uh, yes, combating the pandemic, nurses, doctors, etc., but there also was the classification of essential workers for, and we just had an interview last week about this, that were lumped in with that, which is just essential to keeping capitalism functioning in a way that that keeps the wheels churning. And they were put on the front lines and yet deemed essential. And there was a conflation of those two things and not clarity about who was essential to keeping like people alive and who was essential to keeping profits up. You know, um, I think that's a, a really interesting point. Um, I would add that um, that the the Amazon warehouse pickers, the UPS drivers, the hospital cleaners, uh, the grocery store clerks, they were essential. It's true that they were also keeping the profits going. But they were essential. I mean, how could the rest of us who were lucky enough to be locked down at home survive without right. those grocery deliveries and, and so on and so forth? They, they were essential too, but that was the lower end of the spectrum. The healthcare professionals were certainly essential, the trained doctors, nurses, and so on. But there's this other sort of more working class face, the non-professional face. And those are the ones that I was saying are essential, but are not really valued by capitalist labor markets. They were treated as expendable. Exactly. Right. Um, so we have these uh, crises, and uh, I should say that because I'm getting corrected uh, by our chat, <laughs> the uh, way I'm saying uh, Still crises. on vacation. Yes, exactly. Um, but this, 
and and we don't know whether what we're looking at is a um, is d- developmental in terms of how these uh, crises will impact capitalism versus epochal in that we're at the end of the line or maybe not. I mean, because capitalism has a, uh, a long history of sort of making um, some changes and, and heading into a new phase that addresses these, or at least sort of, uh, I guess, lets the air out of the tires as it were uh, for a certain uh, period of time. Why is it important for us to understand capitalism beyond the uh, Marxist, beyond the the uh economic essential uh, essentialism that we sometimes see in, in marxism like why is it important for us to see all of these elements uh to be to be indicative of capitalism right um you know i, I think it's related to the first part of what you said uh, what's the, what are the possible resolutions here one resolution would be a new form of capitalism, hopefully kinder, gentler, uh, or or probably or possibly worse. Uh, um, another possible resolution is some kind of a post-capitalist society. Again, could be a better one, could be a very authoritarian, nasty one. I guess a third possibility is a s- slow uh, unraveling and descent into war against of all against all and, and barbarism of some kind. But let's let's hope we can avoid that. The point is, for any real significant change, you need a broad set of social forces, a political block, in in which a lot of people who are not necessarily exactly in the same boat, who don't have exactly the same priorities, can nevertheless come together and form a political force that has enough power and enough vision to uh, to, to, uh, insist on a, a, a big societal transformation, hopefully one for the good. What that means, is that we have to think about how to construct a political block that can encompass a lot of different social movements, a lot of different political orientations. I'm talking now about the ones that that most of us would assume would be progressive and potentially emancipatory. That means overcoming the dispersal and fragmentation of the mobilizations that we now see, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Sanders campaign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And um, my thought here is that by showing that the various problems that different groups of us experience, which differ from one another, all have roots in one and the same social system. And it's not until we restructure that social system, we transform that social system, that we'll get to the root of any of this. So my idea is that it's not about saying everyone should forget about the fact that their children are being murdered in the streets by police and jump on the ecological bandwagon, or everyone should stop worrying about sexual assault and sexual harassment and start worrying about police violence. All of these things are urgent. It's it's not about telling people, ranking them, that the economy is more important than climate or that climate is more important than care or whatever. It's about showing that all of these problems, as I just said, can be traced to the dynamics of one social system, and that is capitalism and especially the current neoliberal form of capitalism. And then on that basis, forming a kind of anti-capitalist front, we can be open about what exactly that will mean we want to replace it. Not everyone may share the exact same picture of what a post capitalist world, or even whether we're looking, gonna end up with kinder, gentler capitalism. I'm skeptical of that option, 
but I'm perfectly willing to be in alliance with people who, who still hope for that. Uh, in, in other words, uh, what I'm saying is that by expanding our view of capitalism beyond the economic to take in these other dimensions of the crisis, we have a, a better chance of constructing a, the broad kind of alliance, the broad kind of political front that we need to do something about it. Okay. And so uh, if, if the idea is, you know, we're, we are, um, uh, by expanding our, our definition of capitalism and these uh, multiple crises, um, that we will find more allies, essentially. Um, what is the limiting principle? I mean, because you talk about, you know, and, and, and should there be one as we go out and look for allies? You talk about the different types of, uh, of populism or the, the two types of populism, sort of the left and the right, uh, and, and, and the left having a, um, a binary notion of 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 what we're dealing with in terms of populism and the right having a tripartite uh, uh aversion and then also there the way that the left and the right define their enemies is different is that uh, we, will you walk us through those and is that the sort of the limiting principle is that where we know not this gives us the lines to know where we don't look for allies or is that or is it that we're trying to change the way that um, those who look at the tripartite uh, version of populism adopt the binary. But, but walk us through those and then, and then yeah, answer. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't mean to put that all a, together. A, a great question. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, what I said before about the people losing faith in the established parties and, and political leaders and so on, Look, looking for the out of the box. That's what has given us left populism versus the right, right populism. In the United States, we can say Sanders versus Trump if we go back to 2016, which was when this all uh, exploded. Um, and yes, I think that um, uh, if you think about what the difference between those two, some, in, some of their language overlapped. Right, both of them talked about a rigged system, and that was very interesting. And and that word rigged is such a powerful word; it really resonated with many many people who had been feeling for a long time that you know that they were being sort of played for suckers in in our whole form of life here. Um, okay, um, what's the difference though? Uh, basically, I think that the if we if we talk about uh, Trumpism, for example, right wing populism. I think that their picture of society is that there are the good, real Americans, the virtuous people that are caught between two blood-sucking enemies, right? The, the wealthy bi-coastal elites at the top and the immigrants, the Mexicans, the blacks, the Jews, you know, the, the scapegoats du jour, all of them. And those people are, are, are sucking, you know, uh, uh, preying on the, the virtuous people caught in the middle. That's their map of, of what, uh, how society looks, three levels. I think left-wing populism is much simpler. I think it only has two levels. It has the elites uh, or the capitalist class or whatever language you want to use, uh, the corporate class, let's say. The 1%. The 1%. Percent. The the one one percent. Percent. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And, uh, and then it has basically the people is understood much more broadly because many, many people are preyed upon by that 1%. It's not uh, just those in the middle. It's not just those at the bottom. And the advantage of that is that it, it opens the possibility of that broader alliance of the bottom, the middle, and so on against the very top. That was the whole genius of the language of 99% versus 1%, which is sociologically imprecise, but rhetorically genius, I think. Um, okay, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that you mentioned is, is how are the enemies conceived in each of the two maps, the right populace versus the left populace? And I would say that the right populace, it's very concrete. They want to characterize people in an ethnic way, uh, in terms of color, 
uh, in terms of religion, cultural concreteness. When you say that the, the problems are the immigrants, the Mexican rapists, the, the Jews who cannot replace us, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we are talking in very concrete terms. Left-wing populism is more abstract. It, it refers to Wall Street. It refers to the 1%, as you just said. These are terms that don't say much about the specific identities or cultural profiles of the people, but they talk about the function of those people within the society. That's much better. Look, Wall Street can slide into international Jewish conspiracy. We, we know the history. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, that it, it's impervious, but still, it's a lot better to talk about Wall Street or Silicon Valley than uh, to talk about Mexicans or, or Jews. Or, and, or, or and the left can conceive of a, uh, I, guess, I guess, a, you know, um, uh, someone who is a, who can betray their class because w w they're talking about the function uh, they can portray, you know, a Wall Streeter can betray their fellow Wall Streeters because of their function, as opposed to like, you don't hear the concept of like, this is the one good immigrant. I mean, you know, maybe there's some, maybe there's some good ones in there, you know, that type of thing. But there's no, you can't, you're, you're an immigrant you, or you're not. It is uh, that much more uh, concrete and uh, of an identity uh, yeah, rather yeah. than the, the, the function that you're serving. Um, exactly. And it's much harder to separate the the person from the identity than it is the person from the function. I, I completely agree with you. And that's why I think that uh, even though, as I say, I don't consider left wing populism the end all and be all. I think I hope it would serve as a transition to something like democratic socialism. But nevertheless, it's a lot. Uh, it's it's far superior. It's far more sociologically correct in a way. Uh, it's not Jews who are sucking the blood. It is the, the corporate sector and the, and the financial sector. And these are not the same thing. So um, so the, so the, the, you know this is a, a lot better. And I want to come to the second part of your question though, because you asked how should the left look at those people who are now attracted to right-wing populism? Should we simply write them off and exclude them? And I would say not exactly. I, I want to introduce a, a distinction. Um, I think that on the, 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 the right-wing populist uh, movement, such as it is, includes people whom I would call principled racists, whom I want nothing to do with, and a much larger number of people I would call opportunistic racists, people who will vote for a racist who talks a, a good class line when there's no other alternative on the ballot who's talking a good class line. So we know, for example, that lots of people who eventually voted for Trump, especially in the upper Midwest, who had once voted for Obama when, and they voted and some of them when he was on the ballot for Sanders in the Democratic primary. This shows me that these people are not principled racists, but opportunistic racists. And I think that the, the, the left strategy should be one of splitting. Two splits we have to make. One, we have to split the right wing populist block and get rid of the principled racists on one side and the corporate elites who play a big role in manipulating that side of populism, okay? And, and woo, woo or try to win the, the other component of that right-wing populism. I also think we need to split the other side. And the other side I've called progressive neoliberalism. That might sound like a contradiction in terms, but I, I think it's a real thing. I think it's the sort of the Clinton wing, let's say, of the Democratic Party that basically incorporated a, a, a lot of sort of mainstream feminism, mainstream anti-racism, mainstream LGBTQ, 
political uh, forces and, and hook them up with this regressive pro Wall Street, pro Silicon Valley, pro Hollywood uh, political economy. So it was an anti-working class, an unholy alliance of sort of liberal, the meritocratic liberal wings of social movements and the sort of cosmopolitan sector of the capitalist class. Um, and I want to split them too. I want us to win the feminists, the anti-racists, the LGBTQ forces away from that unholy alliance with corporate capital. And I think that Sanders was trying to do something like this. I, I don't want to idealize the, his campaigns, they weren't perfect, but uh, I think he had something like that double splitting strategy. We have right-wing populism, we have progressive neoliberalism, let's try to build the third thing, call it left-wing populism or democratic socialism. It is, is part of the challenge there that, because to the extent that we saw that separation between the opportunistic uh, racist and the principled racist, if you will. Um, and, and I, and I think w we can argue as to like, really w w what constitutes the, the, the greater, uh, faction in that coalition. But, but, but uh, assuming that there's ample amounts of both to the extent that we saw any of that split happen though, it seems to me that the people who were peeled off to a large extent, are sort of the same type of people who have who on the 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 nominal you know center left are that same same sort of like like ilk of like people who have married that um anti-racism let's call it with some type of like corporate or neoliberal vision right like like we peeled off uh in, in, you know in, in terms of let's say biden peeled off a lot of like suburban uh, the voters who were just sort of turned off by how gross Donald Trump was in those different ways. And it, it, it seems to me that if we were to probably look at an analysis of them, they're, they're more college educated, more likely to be broadly speaking um, in that sort of corporate world um, and sort of, in that financialized world. Is that a dilemma? Yeah, that, 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 that would be a dilemma if uh, it were not also possible uh, to peel off. I mean, I'm uh, the more, let's call them working class sectors. And I don't just mean the white working class. I mean, the whole working class, which includes immigrants, including Hispanics, who are now tending to vote more Republican than they did previously. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to um, imagine a coalition that is sort of working class centered, but also attracts, um, uh, yeah, more educated people who you can call them traitors to their class or whatever, but who, um, who feel that they, they don't have a future in this society. And, you know, young people are extremely important in every period. It's always the young people who are out in the forefront of uh, new progressive uh, forms of social struggle. And look what's happening to the generation of recent college graduates. I see right. it in, in, with my graduate students. They will not have the kind of lives I've been privileged to have, where they're going to become a tenured professor with a lifelong career in something they love. That's not going to happen for 99% of them. So these people who um, might, by by the, if you take them in terms of who their parents are, you might think of as headed up that professional uh, ladder, uh, they're in a different situation. And I think we, I would like to expand our idea of what counts as the working class, right? And that includes professionals. That includes teachers, nurses, all kinds of people, not just truck drivers and coal miners, and hopefully we'll have less coal miners in the future. Uh, but, you know. Uh, some of the so-called PMCs, uh, perhaps, exactly. on some level. 
Exactly. And, and, and I guess it also, I mean, it was just a, you, you, you guys just, uh, a strike was settled at uh, the new school recently, and there's a, a, a 48,000 uh, UC, um, uh, University of California uh, workers uh, uh, striking puts, you know, it adds a little bit more relevance to the idea that mm. there is a uh, sort of a, um, a perception of folks involved in higher education as um, a, as being workers. Um, uh, Absolutely. And and d- d- I, there was this very interesting account uh, a couple, few months ago uh, in the New York Times of the role of young people with a college degree or at least some years of college, the role they played in organizing unions at Amazon, at Starbucks. Uh, There are people who've been at some college who might have expected to be somewhere else and are working as baristas and are organizing unions. This is kind of extraordinary. This is not the way we usually think of you know, how these things happen. So let me ask you, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as a, uh, a final uh, question, what, uh, which is, it's a, it's a much broader one. Um, what is the value, uh, or, or I guess the role of, of, of theory in the context of these things, uh, of, of these struggles? Because, um, I, I, I'm curious as to how much, how much like theory is important in these type of struggles and like how broadly shared or how broadly embraced must be theory and interest in theory and awareness of theory uh, in these type of, you know, uh, responses to these crises and, you know, in determining whether it's developmental or epochal in terms of the changes. I guess I want to think about theory for the purpose of this question in a very simple way. I would just say theory is about connecting the dots, right? It's about showing why Black Lives Matter activists and Me Too activists and Starbucks unionizers and new school (laughs) adjuncts and so on, why uh, they actually have a lot more in common, or at least share some of the same enemies than might become apparent at first glance. Um, it, it doesn't have to be stated in an arcane, academically precise way. I try to state it in an arcane, academically precise way. Uh, but um, if, the, if ideas like that filter out and become part of the common sense of our time so that people connect the dots. They understand that what connects us is not simply sense the, the feeling of affinity with people like us, but an impersonal system that is cannibalizing all of us. Uh, then I think our political possibilities suddenly expand in a very positive way. Uh, that's what, what I, I, I think uh, the role of theory is. It, 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 it gives people narratives or accounts that helps them connect dots, get a bigger sense of who their allies are and a sharper sense of who their enemies are. So it, it, its value is, is determined by its function in increasing uh, solidarity. At the, at the most practical level, yes. I think that there are also uh, beautiful intellectual uh, benefits to be had from theory. But yes, at this level, yes. In, uh, expanding solidarity to the point where you might actually be able to create a political force that is powerful enough and visionary enough to change things in a way that would vastly improve all of our lives. Nancy Frazier, professor of political and social science at the New School for Social Research. Uh, the book is Cannibal Capitalism, How Our System is Devouring Democracy, Care, and the Planet, and What We Can Do About It. We will put a link to that at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been very enjoyable. A pleasure. Thanks, Nancy.